in Colossians 3 this morning. Colossians 3. And I had thought that we would get down through uh, verse 1 of chapter 4 last week, but you women were so insubordinate. Um, <laughs> Got to take another swing at it. We're going to, it's really crazy. We spent the entirety of last time dealing essentially with verse 18. And we're, we didn't even then quite finish it because we're going to look at a complementary passage uh, to help unpack this more. And my hope is uh, in the next period of minutes we'll be able to, to finish this passage and set up towards the end of uh, finishing Colossians. All right, Colossians 3, let's look at verse 18 and 19. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter towards them. All right, so you remember last week I gave you some, some thoughts, so I think some foundational thoughts that have to govern how it is that we think about these issues. And, and I don't know, do you remember what the first thought was? That. Say it again, Jean. We started even before then, so that, 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 that people are created in the image of God. And remember, I asked the question, which people? All people. So all people are created in the image of God. And because that is true, the next statement was true. Do you remember what that was? that people have intrinsic worth as image bearers of God. And as, as much as your family hopefully cherishes you, as much as people that you have or you do work for, as much as they value you as an employee, what you have to understand is that ultimately my value as an individual doesn't come from what I mean to someone else. It doesn't come from what I mean to uh, an employer. It doesn't come to what I could mean to society and culture in terms of what I could do for them. Ultimately, my value comes from the fact that I am someone as a person. What persons? All persons. I'm created in the image of God, and I am an image bearer of God. And my value comes from the fact that I have value because that God views me as valuable. Whether or not Glenn does or doesn't, in the scheme of things, doesn't ultimately matter. Now, that, that's kind of a liberating thought, isn't it? Because my, li my guess is it's likely over the years you have had tr people treat you as though you weren't very valuable to them. I mean, at any given point, th this has happened to all of us to varying extents where people treat us poorly and by virtue of their treatment or sometimes even by the direct statements that they make, they're saying you are effectively worthless. But you know what? In the scheme of things, that doesn't really matter. Do you know why? Because my value isn't determined by them. My value is determined by the fact that I'm created in the image of God and I'm one of his image bearers, and God views me as valuable. In fact, the greatest demonstration of the value that he places on me is what? That I was worth, that you were worth, that people were worth the sacrifice of Jesus. That says something about our intrinsic worth as people that are created in the image of God. All right, so... All right, so people have equal worth and value. Why is that a true statement? Yeah, because it go, and, and I didn't put it on, on here, but it goes back. In fact, some ways it's helpful to, to do this. People have equal worth and value. Why? Because people, which of them? All of them are image bearers because they're created in the image of God. And so... All people have equal worth and value. Now, in any category that we delineate people, whether that is by gender, by race, by uh, nationality, whatever groups that we put people in, um, whatever those groups are that may be identified, it does not transcend this reality that all people, 
regardless of whatever group that you might put them in or how uh, individuals might be labeled or identified, all people have equal worth and value. Now, with respect to what we're talking about here, this has specific application to genders, that all people, all men, all women, all women, all men, have equal worth and value. All of these are true statements, but it is also true this. People do not have the same function. And we talked about that a little bit last week. And in some ways, it's easier to see it when you think outside, for example, of gender stuff, to think about it more in terms of the life of the church. That in the life of the church, we are all equally valuable in God's hands. We're all equally valuable to Him. We have intrinsic worth and value as image bearers of God. Nevertheless, we have different functions, and some of those functions are more, like my, my function in the life of this church is more visible than what someone else is doing because nobody else is standing up here and talking for a half hour on Sunday mornings. That, that's about the most visible thing that you can do in the life of a fellowship, but that doesn't mean that my value ultimately is, is greater to God or greater in the scheme of things to what God's trying to do. Because I am a part of a body, and a body has how many parts that are essential? All of them are essential. If the whole body is going to work properly, and it's, and it's properly going to be doing its functions, every individual part that doesn't do the same function needs to be doing its job. Now, this statement becomes more acceptable when you have these things straight in your mind. And we talked about that that is essential because our society does this. Our society says that your function, what you do, that determines your value. Now, should we disagree with that? We ought to disagree with that. Why, why should we disagree with it? Yeah, because we're people, and my value doesn't come from my function. In fact, this is, this is completely subjective. So, and in fact, because our society says that, that your value comes from what you mean to me or what you can do for me. And if you can't do anything for me, well, then you're of no value to me, right? That's how our, our society and culture works. That's completely subjective. This is a lousy way to operate. Um, and ultimately, it's not true because... My value doesn't come from my function. My value comes from the fact that my value is determined by God who made me and has created me in His image and I am one of His image bearers. All right? So I did that in about nine minutes. It took me 50 to do that last week. Okay? With respect then to the home and to the most basic of human relationships, and this is something that uh, it's likely you have heard this not just in sermons, but in particular at weddings. Uh, it's, and it's a good reminder that before God established the church, the primary building block of life is the family, and it starts with marriage. And so marriage predates the founding of the church by thousands of years. That says something about the importance of the family. Before God called out a nation uh, of people that he identified as his chosen, what did he do? He started with a family, and he started with marriage. That says something about how important it is. Now, as you think about marriage, as you think about men and women, you have to do so through this lens, that Adam was equal in worth and value to Eve. Why? Because Eve, just like Adam, was created in the image of God, and her value is determined by that. However, from the outset, in fact, it becomes, and we talked about an example last week, there are differences in function. In fact, we, we talked about a very clear example in terms of the difference in function between Adam and Eve. That Eve, for example, could do something that Adam couldn't. What was that? Doesn't that say something about function? I mean, if there is something that you absolutely can't do and something that someone absolutely can, that says something about the difference in function, even to the, to the, um, to me, to the manner in which you are made. Now, we are operating in an absolutely asinine and idiotic society where now people pick their pronouns and um, 
it, it, it's so infuriating. There's an actress, her name is uh, Elliot, well, I can't remember what her, her, her given name was. She now says that her, her name is, as a boy, Elliot Page, and uh, about how liberating it is. But like, and you see these pictures of her, and it's so clearly a female. And, and, and like, what, what, this, this doesn't make sense. But we, we operate in a society and a culture that's, that's affirming that and say, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. But it's nonsense. It is ludicrous. And what we ought to be doing, instead of saying that there are no distinctions, is to remind ourselves that the one who made us made us different. Why? Because there was a plan and a purpose. And that plan and purpose involves differences in function. And there are things that women can do that I can't. There are things that I could do that, that for example, a woman could not do. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that this is true. Why? Because these are absolutes. All right? As you go back to Colossians 3, verse 18, you have that statement where there is a effectively a declaration of, of expectation where Paul says that wives, you should submit to and you should submit yourselves to your husbands. Does that say that you should submit yourselves to your husband because you're too dumb to figure this out? Does it say something that you are incapable? Does it say that you lack some capacity, that, that, that there is some deficiency that you have? There's none of that. In fact, and, and unfortunately, we operate in a culture that reads that stuff into it because they're operating with this faulty notion instead of these truths. What there is there is the statement to, for, for wives to make the choice to do something. And that is to submit, which is to say to, to yield to. And we talked about this last week. That is, there's a difference in verse 18, submit yourselves to your husbands. Isn't that different than how verse 20 begins where it says, children, obey your parents? That the call to submission is not a call to obedience. The call to submission does not mean that there is no... I mean, that, that Wayne, you just, sit, you just sit in your house and I, I, this was the illustration I used last... <laughs> In fact, there's a, there's a young couple uh, that's, that's been coming, Chris and Caroline. He's been pay, playing drums for us. And um, he said, you know, I, I don't know a whole lot of it. We've only been married for this for a few years. And I said, hey, do you have a decision room in your home that you go into when you shut the door and then you come out and then make big sweeping gestures and say, I have decided? He said, no. I said, you, you might want to consider that. I don't know. Uh, th 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 this is not a call to that. And it's not saying that wives are just to say, you know, I, I, I'd be glad to weigh, weigh, weigh in on this, but apparently I'm too dumb or I'm not, well, I'm not, my opinion is not, that, that, it doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that you're not partners in family, partners in life, partners in decision making. However, at the end of the day, both husband and wife will stand before the Lord one day to give an account. But on that day, who's going to give an account for the direction of the family? The husband is. And so I believe this call to submission is a call to say, you know what, I'm going to yield to your leadership. That doesn't mean that I, I can't exercise my opinion, that I can't disagree, but, but at the end of the day, I realize that you're going to be held to account. So I'm going to say, big boy, this one's on you. Good luck with that. hope it turns out well. <laughs> It is easy, and we talked about this last week, that this is a verse and a statement that our society and culture would just, I mean, they come at this one with their scissors, saying this is outdated, this is nonsense. But one of the things that, that they will do is to say, well, that was then, this is now. What I want you to understand is that this is not a principle that is, I believe, culturally bound. I want you to look with me uh, to 1 Corinthians 11 for just a second. So 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. It says, 
But I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. Skip down to verse 8. Man did not come from woman, but woman came from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. Skip down to verse, thir- uh, verse 11. And the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, and man is not independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes to woman, and all things come from God. We talked last week when I read the Colossians passage about wives submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord, that our society and our culture rejects that because they would say that it's antiquated or it was, that was a it was cultural. That was, it was, that was a then, this is now. And so we can, just, we can just ignore that. Let me say that there are some things, I believe, in the Scriptures, and you see it uh, both in Old and New Testament, there are some things that were specifically related to the culture of the day that I don't believe are necessarily timeless um, expectations for, uh, for people throughout the course of Christian history. Now, that being said, if you're going to identify something as cultural and say that was then, this is now, you'd better have an awfully good reason for that. And you'd better be able to back it up with some measure of Scripture to say, hey, th- that was dealing with this specific context and the, the totality of the picture helps us to understand that. What I want you to see here is that this principle of submission, Paul is linking to what? In, in 1 Corinthians. What's he linking it to? That was loud. It's linked to creation. Why is that important? Uh, say, say that, Jim. Say it again, Jim. Yeah, th- th- that it came from God, but I mean, to the, you could argue that there were things that God gave that were just specifically cultural and had kind of an expiration date. But why? Why is it important that you see Paul linking this to creation? There's an order to creation. Um, do you see any hint in this passage that the existence of sin changed? This order of creation? No. What, what, you, what you see, I believe, going on here in the First Corinthians passage is that Paul is linking this expectation or this call to submission to say, wait a minute, this has been the plan of God since the outset. Before sin came into the world, there's a pattern for this. But look at what he does. Oh, let's see. In verse 11, he gives an order to things. How does he start? In, in verse 3. Well, no, what does he say? He starts with, who, who does he start with in, in verse 3? Well, he starts, no, before then. He does this. Doesn't he start with Jesus? And then what does he say? And what comes after that? Then he say Christ is the head of every man. And then what comes next? And then how does he finish it? Women, if you could take a picture of this with your phone. And <laughs> Maybe it might help if you put it as a totem pole. In the <laughs> uh, I noticed Wayne laughed a little too much on that. You might need to talk to him afterwards. <laughs> If he doesn't, he will be reminded very soon. (laughs) 
Let, let me ask you this. All right. Um, when, when the Bible says God, most of the time, what do you think? When there's just the general term God. Well, you think creator, but it's like... You say D-O-T. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said the D-O-T. I thought, what is this? I guess it's an opinion answer. There's no wrong. She said deity, not D-O-T. Um, don't you think God the Father? And most of the time, that, that's, that's typically accurate. That's typically accurate. But one of the things that we get from the totality of Scripture is that we have God, and we talked about this before, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. That's the totality of the picture that we get uh, from the whole of Scripture, not just in a single place. There, there are plenty of pla single places that communicate this, but we see this Old Testament, we see this in New Testament. And when we're talking about the Trinity, we've talked about this before, this, it gets very complicated. And it gets complicated because there's nothing in our experience that's exactly like it where we could say, oh, that's kind of like tomato soup and grilled cheese and just the balance between it. There's nothing that we can exactly compare this to. And so there's a difficulty that we get in completely understanding this. We can kind of get our arms around it, but that's about the best that we can do. What I want you to see is that between the members of the Godhead, there is absolute equality in nature and being. That when we talk that, that God the Son is no less God than God the Father. And that God the Spirit is no less God than God the Son. So there is absolute in essence being in nature. And it kind of goes back to it's, it's kind of an equivalent to this statement that there is equality in worth and value. All right, what you see, however, is between Father, Son. In fact, how I, how I even wrote that on there, isn't that kind of how you think about it? Well, there's a good reason that you think about that because there is a sense in which that's absolutely how the Scripture paints it. Because what's at play is that even though there is absolute equality in essence, nature, and being, there is difference in function. In fact, the, the, the more technical t title is this. There is subordination of function. In fact, the most technical title for what's going on in the Trinity is this. It's functional subordination. So that... And I think this helps. You, I know you can't read that scribble, but it says God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. I think saying it that way helps to underscore this, that equal worth and value. But seeing it this way helps to communicate this whole functional subordination. And what we get from the scriptures is this picture that the Spirit has a primary function, which is to do what? It's to draw attention to the Son. And what's the Son's primary function? I'll give you a hint. One day every knee will bow and every tongue confess what? That Jesus is Lord. How does that verse end? To the glory of what? to glory of God the Father. That communicates functional subordination. Does that mean somehow that Jesus is the hireling? Does that mean that Jesus is somehow less than? No, it, it doesn't mean. Does, this, does this mean that the Spirit is just kind of like he's the red-headed stepchild and 
You know, he just got the scraps of what was left over. So he got all the good stuff. No, there's absolute equality in essence, nature, being, but there is difference in function, and there is a functional subordination. Don't you see that here? Where he says that the head of Christ is what? God. And what's he talking about? He's talking about God the Father. Not only is he linking this to creation, he's linking it to what? He's linking it to the Trinity or even to, to the Godhead. This whole idea of subordination, he's linking both to creation and to the Godhead. Why is it important that he links it to the Godhead? Or what's the benefit of linking it to the Godhead? Let me ask you this. Ladies, because I, I realize I can't read this verse through the lens of female eyes because I'm not one. And so I realize that your experience is different than mine. Mine is different than yours. And so um, I don't get fully what it's like to have that statement directly apply to me. I understand that. Um, which is to say, I understand that I don't completely understand what that, how that feels. Does it feel better to realize that what God is asking of you is to operate how the Trinity works? I, I would like to think that it does. Because as Jesus is not the hireling, as the Holy Spirit is not the red-headed stepchild, I'm not my husband's hireling. I'm not the servant. I'm not the one that he... <clears throat> and you, you come and say, yes, dear. You rang. The, the husband sits there with, with a bell. Now, the other thing that's important, though, too, is... He's linking it to creation. He's linking it to the Trinity. But it's also, I think, encouraging because he links this. That, 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 in fact, if you want to make this more specific. Husband and wife. That the husband is not operating in isolation. Where he's like, fee fi fo fum Me hungry. You get me something. Ring, ring. Why, why is that not the case? Because Ricky used to tell it to Lucy, but it was true for Ricky. He had some splaining to do, didn't he? And so, I think when we understand this and keep it in the context of a plan that has been unfolding since creation, and even the Trinity itself works this way, it makes us feel better about this. Not only does it, I think it makes women feel better about this, but it also is an encouragement for husbands to keep it in check, doesn't it? Because, like I said, husbands, you've you got some responsibility. There's some accountability that you have, um, and God takes this whole issue of accountability seriously. The other thing that you see is in verse 11 where I think it's, it's helpful to remember and I really feel like the Bible is giving us the full picture of this. And even though we have a culture and society that wants to come at these passages with scissors and say, well, that's just gobbledygook and nonsense and antiquated uh, drivel. I think it's important to get the statement of verse 11 that talks about how we are not operating as islands unto ourselves. that We are dependent on each other. And so it goes... Verse 11 doesn't end with a period after man. It doesn't say woman is not independent of man. Get in your place. You are dependent on man. How does that verse end? Man is not independent of woman. Why? Well, in the beginning, woman came from man, but then every other man that showed up afterwards, how did he show up? Through the woman. Does that make you feel better? It should. It should. Again, this reminds us that there is a plan and it goes all the way back to creation so that this is not antiquated cultural relic. This is a communication. This is how it has always supposed to have been. This is how it's supposed to operate even in the presence of sin. Does that make sense? All right, let's... Good night. I have spent almost two weeks on one verse. 19, Colossians 3, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives. Don't be bitter to them. 
It's interesting. There is no biblical command for wives to love their husbands. Isn't that interesting? There's all sorts of speculative reasons as to, to why I suppose that has been given. But, and it's likely also that you're, you're aware that the New Testament uses some different words that are translated love. And this is the, the agape form of love, which is a sacrificial love. And why do you think it would it'd be that one that would be used here telling husbands, hey, this is how you're supposed to operate towards your wives, sacrificially, that, that, that type of love. Not, oh, I think you're good looking. Or I got the hots for you. That's a different type of love. Why, why, is, this talk, why is it using the word for sacrificial love? Well, it, it, it's, it's thinking like this, but like if, if, I am, if I am operating sacrificially in my relationship towards you, you know what I'm regularly doing with myself? Yeah, I'm getting in the back seat. And so that I am trying to pursue your good and your benefit, even at the expense of my personal preference. What does that help? It helps this stay in check, doesn't it? And the other thing is, if, if as a wife, your husband is loving you sacrificially, and the best example of this agape love is what? Is that. If your husband is doing that, how, does, how much easier does verse 18 get? It gets a whole lot easier. I mean, it's, I mean you don't even have to think about it. Why? Because he is sacrificially operating, working for your good. The other thing is that type of that type of attitude and that type of disposition, that type of affection for your spouse uh, will preclude this whole idea of acting like a dictator. You're not going to be snapping your fingers and barking orders and ringing bells uh, because you know that she will ring your bell. You don't, you're not going to do that. But why? Because you love her. You feel towards her like Christ feel, felt towards the church who gave himself for her. That's how you're supposed to operate. All right, verse 20. So clearly, we spent all that time on the wives. Y'all were the problem. Um, guys, you pretty well you got it all together. Uh, <laughs> Children, obey your parents in everything, uh, for this pleases the Lord. In truth, we could spend significant amounts of time on everything that's being said here, but I'm just wanting to, um, for, the, for the benefit of making some progress, to, to just kind of hit some high spots. Um, it does seem today that there has been a shift in what parenting looks like. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know, I think in truth part of it stems from the fact that um, so many times, so many parents spend so little time with their kids. Right? Right? I mean, because the, the, the average American family, if you have mom and dad present, uh, typically you get up, and this is obviously COVID has changed some of the calculus of this, but generally what it looks like is that you get up, you get fed. If you got little kids, so you get them fed, you get them dressed, and uh, you get other kids, you're getting ready for school, and then you either, if you've got older kids, you, they either drive to school, you take them to school, or they get on the bus, or if you got little kids, what do you do with them? Most of the time. Now, most of the time, you know, you, you're going to go take them somewhere. And I don't know if, if we give thought to this, but the, the, the majority of American households, th for the earliest of years, birth through, birth through kindergarten, the majority, of, uh, the majority of children spend more of their waking hours, more of their waking hours with strangers than they do with their own family. Is that a false statement? Am I lambasting people are doing that? No, I'm just, I'm just saying that that's what the norm is. It is. And so parents pick up their kids, and parents have been, most American families, if you've got mom and dad, most, uh, most are two working, uh, it's a dual income household, both are, are working. And um, so you get home, and then it's a mad rush to get something to eat, right? And so... Uh, Sometimes because you're just tired or you're working late or something like that, we wind up going to get stuff, pick up stuff a lot, or 
we're just tired. There's so much that's prepackaged, and so we, by and large, we're eating worse. Uh, but anyway, we get home. If you've got little kids, get them fed, and then how much time are you going to be hanging out with them before what? Yeah, I mean, so like our, our youngest, John, he goes, he's, he's in bed at 7.30. And you know what we're saying? Hallelujah. <laughs> but think about that. If, if John were uh, in the normal circumstance, we would get him up in the morning, get him fed, and then we'd drop him off. We'd pick him up 5.30-ish, get home and the, it's a mad rush to make sure to, to get fed and you got about an hour he spent how many hours with a stranger that day eight nine how many days does he do that five days a week and think about this if that child then on sat on sat on sunday so we get up if you come to church you can come to church and what are we gonna do we're gonna we're, we're gonna we're gonna hand them off again to somebody else and then as soon as church is over, we can get home, mad rush to eat, and then what are we going to do with that kid? No, well, no, you go lay down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, I believe sincerely that this has had a dramatic effect on what parenting looks like. Uh, in part, I think, I mean, candidly, I, I think there are parents that feel some measure of guilt because they, they're gone so much. And, you, I mean, you want, to, you want to kind of pamper your kids. And so... You're away from them so much of the time. I feel like there's this desire. Let me just, I'm going to throw them a bone. And so I think, unfortunately, what that has led is a lot of parents to operate like their kid's friend as opposed to their parent. And there is plenty of time in adulthood for you to be your kid's friend. But when your child is a child, what they need is a mama and a daddy. And unfortunately, uh, we have many that have forgotten that. And when you forget that, the, the expectation of verse 20 disappears because the expectation is that children are to obey. Now, there, there is, a, there is a, uh, an implication in that, which is to say that parents are to give things that children are to obey. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of times parents ap- that are motivated, and I, don't th- I think it's subconscious. I don't think someone's saying, oh, I want to go AWOL on parenting responsibility and just be my kid's friend. I don't think that people are sitting down and making that conscious choice. I believe that it's happening. But because of that, they are not establishing clear, they're not establishing clear parameters and boundaries for their kids to operate and saying, you're going to do this. This is, how it, this is how it goes. This is how it works. And these are the consequences when you go out of line. And I, I really think, and I don't know, um, this, is, this is opinion and conjecture at this point, but I think a lot of it stems from the fact, sincerely, that a lot of parents are feeling kind of bad because they're gone so much. I think that makes sense. I mean, to me it does. Maybe, anybody take issue with that? I mean, you're welcome. I, mean, I, I, I could be completely wrong, but I do know that this Bible says that the children, the expectation is to obey. And that implies parents better be parenting and giving their children stuff to obey. And they ought to be doing this because that's pleasing to the Lord. And that goes all the way back to this. This is how God expected this to work. And he says uh, in verse 21, fathers do not exasperate. The word exasperate, some of your Bibles say what? Provoke. Um, God has ordered the family so that children are to obey parents. And then within the marital relationship and within the family relationship that the husband, that the father is the, the primary leader within the home. So that kind of gives him not author, authoritarian, uh, authoritarian rule. And so he's able to operate like you know, Hitler or something like that. But it does mean that, he, that God's going to hold him ultimately re- responsible. So there's an extent, extent to which the buck kind of stops with him. And so what can happen is that you could have a guy that's operating with the notion, well, they got to do what I say. And sometimes I'm just going to stick it to them just to get a rise out of them, just, just, just because I can. And the biblical mandate is, guys, don't be doing that. Don't be doing that. I mean, I realize at this point, I'm the youngest in, in this room, and I'm, I'm in the active stages with, uh, of child rearing uh, with, with teenagers all the way down to toddlers. But um, 
I believe that there's application for this for you as a grandparent with your grandchildren. Uh, but I believe even with, um, with, in dealing with adult children that you need to operate in such a way that the end result is not to just provoke, not to get a rise. That's not how it is that you should be operating. Oh, man. Um, very quickly, he starts talking about the relationships between slaves and masters. I think one of the things, and it's certainly for us as Americans reading this, when we think slavery, we think what American slavery looked like. And even though it's using the same word, it wasn't exactly, and historically, it has, slavery hasn't existed most of the time how it operated specifically in the United States, that slavery at this point generally, now there would be some exceptions to this, generally was not racial, it was more political. And so that if you were to be a slave in the first century, how did you wind up being a slave? Because the Romans conquered you. And they decided, you know what? You could be, you are useful to the economy, you are useful to the work effort, and so we are just taking this, we're annexing this new territory, we come in with our armies, we come in with our chariots, and so we're going to take a stack of you and we're going to send you back to where we need some help. We've got some projects going on in Colossae and we need you, we're going to be sending you, uh, we're going to be sending you there. That by and large is how it was operating at least in the first century, especially in a Roman context. And some have lambasted this passage because uh, Paul is not going after slave owners and, uh, and attacking the institution of slavery. I would argue, and I think it's pretty clear, in the end, he's not saying anything about the institution. He's, he's dealing with reality. This, this is the lay of the land. This is how it's operating at this point. And so if you are in whatever circumstance you're in, so if you're in a marital relationship, this is how it's supposed to work. If you are in a parental relationship, this is how it's supposed to work. If you are, unfortunately, even in a slave master type of situation, this is how... As a, as a follower of Christ, this is how you can and should be operating. And what he says is this. Listen, you ought to operate as though you don't ultimately answer to a human master, but you operate as though you ultimately answer to the Lord. And so you do what you're going to do, he says, wholeheartedly, um, as, as if you're, you're not doing it for somebody, that, that ultimately that you're doing it for the Lord. And I believe sincerely that this has application for, for all people in, at every point. Uh, anybody uh, that is doing something for uh, or doing work for someone else, um, you might have felt like you were enslaved to your employer, and I've, obviously that wasn't the case, but it is very likely that um, you have at least observed this, that you had, oh, you ever been to the DMV? You ever seen how DMV employees do what they're doing? I hope no DMV people are watching this video, but um, we don't like going there, do we? Why is that? Well, because you're, you, you tend to be treated really poorly. And do you know why the DMV can treat uh, the, the clients poorly? Do I? Do I? They have authority. What did you say, Glenn? They've got what you, you don't have any choice. And so you, you, you got to play by, I mean, you, 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 there's no competition. So you got to have a license. You got to go to the DMV, period. I mean, you can't just say, well, I'll go to Target. I don't, I'm going to go to Chick fil A. They're really nice in the drive through. I'm going to see if I can get my driver's license there. But honestly, the line is so long, your driver's license could expire while you're at Chick fil A. Um, and for the life of me, I don't understand that. People wait in a 40 minute line. I mean, good grief, you could pluck a chicken by the time people are ordering that sandwich. But, um, and then paying, Anyway, that's another conversation. I believe there is application in the sense that everything that you are entrusted with, that whatever work that you do, you ought to do it as though you're doing this for the Lord and that the Lord is going to be looking at what you're doing. And that means that you, that you do things like... We constantly struggle with this, with, the, with especially the oldest boys. They are operating with, what is the bare minimum I can possibly do so as to keep from getting in trouble? So, like, if I just shove stuff over in this corner, maybe, just maybe, uh, that'll keep me out of the hot seat. 
And um, I'm like, oh, will, you, will you quit doing such a, will you do it decently? You, you, we're trying, they're trying to do the bare minimum. As followers of Christ, we ought not be doing that. That We ought to be doing, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing the best that we can do it, regardless of what circumstance that, that, that you are in. Uh, realizing in verse 24, he says that you're going to re receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. And that's true of every person everywhere that has, does, or will exist. That ultimately this is the hierarchy. And you're ultimately going to answer to the Lord for how you do everything and how you operate in every way in this life. And he says specifically, and this, this has specific application for those that were operating as masters of, of slaves in the first century. He says, it's a reminder, because God is going to hold people to account, he says the wrongdoer is going to be paid back for whatever wrong he's done, and God's not going to be showing favoritism. And so justice will be served. So... Um, he concludes in verse 1 of chapter 4, Masters, deal with your slaves just, justly and fairly since you know that you have a master in heaven. I landed the plane. Any questions? Uh, obviously, uh, we spent most of our time at the beginning of that, and I had, that was a cursory overview of the end of it. Any questions, brilliant comments? Well, thank you for being here. This is High Attendance Day. It's good to see you, and my, my hope is, as... As things continue to progress, that you remind folks about this as we see some of our folks beginning to trickle back in. And especially, you think about some folks that you haven't seen. Something I have said repeatedly to folks, this is a, I feel like with, with respect to risk, obviously there's some risk anytime you do something in person. I feel like this might be the very lowest thing because uh, you, you can sit a long way away from anybody if you want to, right? So if you're watching this, you could be here and you could sit way over there. Because nobody's way over there. Um, anyway, it's good to see you. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for letting us walk through this passage today. And I sincerely pray, Lord, uh, that I have been faithful to what you have communicated in your word. And as we look at our own individual lives and our individual functions that you've called us to, that we realize that we are not a bit less valuable uh, to you and that our worth ultimately comes from you, and that whatever function it is that you have as a part of your plan for us, that we do it uh, to the best of our ability, realizing that in the end, we answer to you. And it's in Christ's name we say all this. Amen.